uh, we're going to get started here about Second Corinthians. I've been reading the letter of Second Corinthians, trying to understand Paul's way of thinking there and his attitude uh, uh, towards the church at Corinth um, for lots of reasons. Uh, you know, my personal, I guess, reasons for delving into this letter were uh, that I thought about the things Corinth had been doing that he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians about and realized that, you know, this place at Corinth was pretty far out there. It was, it was pretty wild. And, um, you know, they had a lot of things to make right um, that needed to be addressed. And this letter talks about some of those things um, in uh, ways that say they were successful. So I thought it was an interesting thing to look at it and try to learn from Paul, uh, you know, for my, for my, um, I guess from my perspective, uh, how to think the way that he's thinking about how to bring about a repentance and a restoration and, and bring the good things. Um, even if thing, even if it seems kind of crazy, um, like Corinth was. So that was what I was hoping to get out of it. And um, that's where these came from. But the first of these lessons is the focus on the fact that Paul is is uh, planning to visit Corinth. So the, the whole letter, the basis of the letter is that he's planning to come. <laughs> and that's the... You know, the, the opening of the letter and the closing of the letter is he's planning to come. And that's really the, the structure that's being provided for us in it. And um, so the, the purpose, therefore, of the letter is to prepare them for that visit, to be ready. Um, not so much that he is important or he is the focus, but that they want to be right and they want Paul to find them doing right. Um, what we, what I found in reading this letter um, again is that he had missed his last scheduled visit to Corinth. He had intended to come to them, and then he did not come to them. And that's the first thing he addresses in this letter was that he did that on purpose. <laughs> um, you know, the next thing he talks about is that what he had written to them before in 1 Corinthians that in some cases pained them was written out of love. His love for them and uh, now it becomes their love for the one who, is, who has been restored. And in the end of the letter, uh, again, looking at these kind of, I guess, bookends, if you will, uh, the, the structure, the envelope, whatever you want to call it. At the end of the letter, his point is he wants to get there and he wants his visit in person to be used for building rather than for rebuking. Um, that's what this letter is about. So where I maybe thought at first that he seemed uh, maybe permissive or he seemed to have a different perception of the status of the church there than I had. And therefore I needed to think about my attitude. I, realizing now that he did not actually let them off the hook. He's just trying to make sure that any opportunity for the truth to succeed, any opportunity for them to do right is available to them. Uh, he makes sure that uh, what is good is called out as good and is built upon and is the basis for appealing for more good. And uh, this is the right approach. But uh, the first thing uh, in that letter is that, you know, on he, his second visit was missed, and it was missed on purpose. So that's where we start in chapter 1 at verse 23. 
when he tells them, I call God to witness against me, it was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. So again, at the 23rd verse, he said, it was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. So his second visit, scheduled visit, was missed because he wanted to spare them. <laughs> what do we mean? Well, you know, really, when, once we get down to this and you see the rest of the verses, you'll realize that what he's, the reason for this is that he wants them to repent before he comes back. And that wasn't ready yet. He didn't want to come to them a second time after having written 1 Corinthians before they had done what he wrote about. And then you have this problem of, well, these are the instructions and you have them. You know, what gives? Why aren't you doing this? You know, that's not a very enjoyable uh, visit for one thing, but it's also not a very productive one. Uh, they already have the tools they need to take the next step. They need to take that next step. Otherwise, there's not really a reason for him to come again. That's what he's getting at. It was to spare you. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. You know, that's an interesting thing that it says, you know, we're not doing this to assert authority over the faith that you hold. You stand firm in the faith, which is to say they do know, they have, and they know the truth. That's what it means. There's something else that they are missing. They need help with joy here. We work with you for your joy. You stand firm in your faith. And that's a distinction I had not been drawing in my mind um, that needs to be drawn. There is faith and there is hope and there is love, according to Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, First Corinthians chapter 13. And these three are the big three, the greatest of which is love, but they stood in their faith. They had the truth. They knew the truth. They know God in whom they have believed. They, it, there's no question about, do they believe in God? Are they Christians? Yes, they believe in God. Yes, they're Christians. But what about the rest of it? Do they hold on to the hope that yields the joy? And uh, this is what I think he's getting at when he continues that thought in the first verse of the next chapter. I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. I'm, I'm not going to come back because painful visit here would be the opposite of the joy that he said. We're not here to lord it over your faith. You know what the truth is. We're here to work with you for joy. You stand firm in the truth, but we're here to work for joy. I made up my mind. I'm not going to make another painful visit to you. You don't need that. And there's a reason they don't need that. Is pain the opposite of joy? I think it is. I think what he's saying here is those painful visits are the opposite of the joyful visits. That would be joyful if the church there had repented and had obeyed the, the commandments of discipline in 1 Corinthians 5 and all the other things that he was talking about, whatever else may have been out of order. But perhaps at the time that he was planning to come, they hadn't yet completed those things. And he said, I'm not going to visit at that time to spare them. And this is interesting at 2 Corinthians 2, 1, that he said, I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. It's very similar to what he said in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 1 and 2, where he said, I decided or determined to know ahead of time, I determined ahead of time, really, 
to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. <clears throat> Prior to coming to Corinth, he had decided ahead of time that he would not be an expert in the law of Moses or an expert in Roman culture or an expert in uh, Greek philosophy, even though he was schooled in all of those things and qualified, he would know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified among them. Now he says, I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. And that's telling us that they weren't ready for him to visit a second time. Or maybe he did come a second time and it was already painful. But I think the point of that is fairly clear. He said, there's no use in this. We don't need to do that. You've got to move on before we do it. But now that was, you know, that's old news. He's writing to them now saying, I'm coming. But we note that the reason for which he did write the things that he wrote, which were some pretty harsh things, as you think about it, like we said at the, at the start, um, the stuff they were doing seems pretty far out, pretty crazy. But he said to them in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 4, I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. So it wasn't necessarily what Paul wanted to do. And it's not what we want either. When rebuke is necessary, well, rebuke is necessary. We're called upon to rebuke sometimes, and we have to do it. But it's not something you want to do out of affliction, anguish of heart, with tears. You may have to do things like this. It's not a pleasant thing. But it's not so that they will be pained by it. It's so that a good outcome will result. That's what he means. I want to let you know the abundant love I have for you. That's why I wrote. What he means by this is that the church there can know that letter came from a place of love. Because he loved them abundantly, had enough love for them, therefore he wrote to them some things that were not pleasant to receive, not pleasant to hear. And it has to come from love. In order to be effective, it has to come from love in order to be godly. Then at the eighth verse, he said, I beg you, reaffirm your love for him. Because they had somebody there who was, um, you know, sleeping with his stepmother, which is a sin. And they allowed him to continue in this practice and to continue to be a part of the congregation when it's clearly a sin. And Paul wrote to them that this one should not be among the saints living that way. He should be corrected. And he was. And then he repented. And he put that stuff away from him. And he wants to be a part of the congregation again. Discipline does work. And so Paul wrote to them at 2 Corinthians 2 8, I beg you, reaffirm your love for him. And the reason given ultimately is at the 11th verse, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. We are not ignorant of his designs. So Paul loved Corinth enough to write them. God loved Corinth enough to correct the lack of discipline. They loved God enough to perform the discipline. But now what he says is reaffirm your love for him. That means the call is they have to love each other enough to be able to forgive and comfort and restore this person. Um, which is the thing that very often is not done in discipline situations um, where somebody commits some sin, uh, adultery or drinking or something like this, which is clearly wrong, and the church will discipline them perhaps, and they'll repent. But what you see happen after that is seems like people don't 
don't forget about it. Don't leave it in the past. <laughs> you see, like, somebody is genuinely repentant. Somebody wishes to be restored. And they're allowed to do that, but they're, you know, they never get used again to lead a prayer, to lead singing, or to teach. I don't think that's right. I think that's being outwitted by Satan. Because that person has to be reaffirmed. They, they have to know that we do have a genuine forgiveness in God, and, and a genuine repentance is met with a genuine restoration. We're all subject, you know, to these attacks from Satan if we're at each other's throats. I mean, that's his design, is that we are attacking each other, maligning each other. That makes it easier for him. <laughs> but we are not supposed to be like that. But he says, this is why I'm writing this to you. And I think this is an important aspect of the letter that needs to be understood. As we said, he had been there before. They were doing a lot of crazy things. He wrote a lot of things in the letter that are fairly sharp. And he did so because of his abundant love for them. And it worked. That individual repented. And now they are called upon to make sure and follow through the rest of the instruction and re restore that person. And there's something else here between the lines in everything that we've been reading so far um, in 2 Corinthians 7. At verse 12, when he speaks again about the discipline that they did, he says, 2 Corinthians 7, 12, although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did wrong, nor yet for the sake of the one who suffered a wrong. That is not why he wrote to them. He wrote to them in order that their earnestness for the apostles might be revealed to them in the sight of God. As he said, in order your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. It's not so much that he's involved in the local affair of uh, that local congregation to be concerned about the individuals who are caught up in this problem. It's the bigger picture of the teaching and the practice. But look at what he's saying. I did write. It wasn't about the individuals. He said it's about your earnestness for us. I mean, their genuine uh, concern for what God teaches and what God wants. Their genuine concern for what has been written because it is the power of God. But who needs to know this? He said it will be revealed to you in the sight of God. They need to know this. <laughs> What we're saying is that Paul intentionally stayed away because he wanted to let the letter, 1 Corinthians, do its work among them. The word is where the power is. That's how you know what to do and how to be pleasing to God. And so he stayed away from them. He stayed aloof and wrote instead because the power is in the word, not in his presence. You know, we, we, we mentioned 1 Corinthians 2 earlier, and I would go back to there again in verses 4 and 5. He said, my speech and message were not in plausible words of wisdom. They were in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That was the first Corinthians 2, verse 5. 
This one now is saying, I wrote to you before so that you would discover your own earnestness. You would discover that it's the letter. You're obedient to the word, not to me, in my presence. And this, I think, is a very important thing to understand because you find very often that there are champions among the people. Um, you might say that shouldn't be the case, but whatever it is, very often you find that there are times that somebody who has faith is the leader or a leader is a great strength. And then the minute that person is gone, nobody seems to know what to do. And that's a problem. It shouldn't be like that. The power is in the word, not in the presence of some individual who has a great faith. We have to go back to the word. And at the end of the letter, 2 Corinthians 13, um, at verse 10, he said, For this reason I write these things while I'm away from you, so that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Yes, you see, he's writing while away. That's his point. He's staying away and using the word. The word is where the power is. They need to realize that it's the letter that they're following. And you and I need to realize that it's the letter they were following. Because they're not getting something you know, the church at Corinth did not, does not have an advantage over us because Paul visited them in person. That's what we're saying. The fact that he went there in person does not confer upon them some advantage. They were given the letter to tell them what to do. And when they hadn't conformed to that letter, he didn't come back. Now that they have conformed to that letter, he's ready to visit them again. But he's writing this letter with the intent that when he does get there, he won't have to tear down. He will have opportunity to build up. And this he had also said in 1 Corinthians 4.21, this echoed in my mind when I read these verses, that he said, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? What would you like? How will it be when I get there? And this is just Paul. You know, it's not the Lord returning. <laughs> when the Lord returns, we all give answer for what we have done. This is just Paul's visit. But even Paul, when he visited, you know, if they hadn't repent, if they hadn't done what he said, then he would have to use the authority given him to be severe, to, build, uh, to tear down rather than to build up. But he's saying, I, I don't want that. That's what, that's what this is coming down to. He doesn't want to be severe. He doesn't want to have to show up and say things that they don't want to hear. But the truth is, he's afraid that that's what it's going to be. And there's a reason for that, too, which we'll look at. He doesn't want to be severe with them when he gets there. He is afraid, though then he'll have no choice. There are reasons for that. On the one hand, we read that he doesn't want to show boldness. Uh, a little bit earlier in the letter, 2 Corinthians 10. But then at the end of the letter, in the 13th, what we just read, that he doesn't want to be severe. But in the middle of that, he does harbor serious fears. So we'll look at this too. Give Paul a choice, is what I say. <clears throat> Although I usually say this to my dogs, you know, stop barking, give me a choice, boy. <laughs> Don't make me come out there. <laughs> but 
But truly, give Paul a choice. 2 Corinthians 10, at verse 2, he said, I beg of you that when I am present, that is, when I come, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Some people think that Paul is just trying to gain something, some money or notoriety or friends or something, walking according to the flesh. That's not what he's doing, but that's what some of them think, and that's what some of them are saying about him. They said, I beg you, don't make me show boldness. You know, that's what he's saying. Don't make me turn this car around, right? <laughs> I don't want to have to come there and, uh, you know, get into a disagreement. <coughs> What he really is asking them to do is to settle these matters, settle these questions and problems by means of the letter, 1 Corinthians. Get that done. And in the 13th chapter, in the 7th verse, beginning, he said, we pray to God that you may not do wrong. What they really want is the church there not to do wrong. That's what they're after. Not looking for money, not looking for esteem or friendship. They are looking for the church there not to do wrong. They want the church to be established. And as he says, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. They're just selfless about this. Not so that we can prove our work was good, our teaching was good, our building was good. That's not the point. Even if it looks like our teaching was not good, uh, we failed. If you all are doing what's right, then that's what we want. And that starts at ninth verse. We're glad when you, we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. This is why I'm writing these things while I'm away from you, so that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority the Lord has given me, which he gave him for building up, not for tearing down. Building up and tearing down, these, you know, this is vocabulary from construction. Where, you know, the answer really to what Paul is saying is, it depends entirely on where we are in the construction phase. <laughs> are we at the point where there's some existing structure or problem that needs to be torn down? Or have we already taken care of those sins and problems of the past? And we now have laid a new foundation and we are ready to build again. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, when he gets here, is he going to have to tear down the wrong and the sin and the practices that are still there, even though they were already told about these things? Or will they have cleared those things away and now they're ready to build what is next? That's what he's getting at. Why is he afraid? Well, um, there's two things, or I guess there's two passages. It's the 11th chapter. First thing... And the 13th is uh, the second, or sorry, the 12th is the second one. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He is afraid. How did the serpent deceive Eve? Well, the way that he did that was to get her to think that there's more to it. There's something else being hidden from you. You're being duped. You're being lied to. There's something else to know here. There's something, some bit of wisdom here that is not yours. You're not getting the full story, the full picture. That's what he told Eve, and she believed that and decided to eat the fruit as a means of learning what's behind this. 
which is what happens in the fourth verse. If someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the Holy Spirit you've received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. They, they allow this among them. They allow these things to be said. You put up with that readily enough. This is open-minded, and it's good to be open-minded, but don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out, right? That's the idea. It's good, you know, be quick to hear, yes, listen to what somebody is saying, make sure you understand what they're saying, but when it's clear that they're proclaiming another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel, you don't put up with that. That has no place. But they're letting it be. Why would you do that? Because you think, perhaps, people are holding out on you. There's something else here. There's, there's more to it. If I just understood it in a different way, in a better way, maybe I could rise above and do things that people had never thought of, you know, that all of that stuff that goes through people's heads, which is nothing more than the serpent deceiving us by his cunning. Sincere and pure is talking about the simplicity, that the, the, the one-sidedness, the, you know, the, the, the genuine 100% truthness of the gospel and of Jesus. There's not something being held back or hidden from us. He, God doesn't have a dark side. But those that are proclaiming a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel are effectively saying, oh, there's something you didn't understand. There's something you didn't get. There's something here that has been hidden from you. And they're listening to that. As we say, it's good to hear. It's good to understand what somebody is saying. And none of us is a repository of all truth. There may be things that are true that we did not understand. That is possible. But they put up with another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. That shouldn't be. they got to draw lines. We dealt with the, in, I'm sorry, we dealt with the individual sin in 1 Corinthians 5. It's now time to deal with these much larger problems, the public teaching. 2 Corinthians 12, 19 the apostle says, have you been thinking all along that we are defending ourselves to you? <laughs> As he writes the letter saying, you know, I sent the letter out of an abundant love for you. I stayed away to spare you. You got some who are thinking, well, they're just defending themselves. They're just trying to cover their tracks, you know, explain why they didn't show or whatever. He said, no, it's in the sight of God. We've been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. Their concern is a selfless concern. It's not about how blameless they are. That's not why they're saying what they're saying. They're saying it because they want people to understand we are supposed to rely on the word, not on them or their personal presence. Second Corinthians 12, 20, I fear that perhaps when I come, there's two things. The first is this one. That I may find you not as I wish, and you may find me not as you wish. That maybe there will be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, disorder. Just still dealing with internal problems, power struggles, being at each other's throat. Are they still dealing with that? He said, I'm afraid that might be what happens. Or have they already learned to start relying on what was written? And the second fear is this one at 2 Corinthians 12, 21. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you. I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, sensuality that they've practiced. Yeah, that when he shows up, 
after having taught the truth in person and also having written plainly in 1 Corinthians, that they may still embrace fornication. That they sinned earlier and have not since repented. Which is telling us, well, the discipline worked for the man directly uh, involved in 1 Corinthians 5 that we talked about, the man who had a stepmother. But have the rest of the church followed suit? Have they listened to everything that was written? He seems to have reason to worry that they have not. And these are valid concerns. If, if you think that something like this is happening, you'd be kind of worried about it. Well, let me close out this lesson by using 2 Corinthians 3, something that he said to them which also highlights the power of the letter. Second Corinthians 3, verse 3, he said, You show you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. The church at Corinth is a letter, and so are we. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. <coughs> no, that's what you're... That's what we're aiming for, that the church looks like what is written in these letters. Not just 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians, but all the letters of the New Testament that describe the churches, what they're involved in, what they're doing, do those letters describe what we are doing? Do we show that we are a letter from Christ? Yeah, delivered by the apostles, true. They wrote these things, and we hold these words still. This Bible that we have has compiled a compilation of their writings, yes. But when we obey that from the heart, then we show that we are a letter from Christ. We, we fit, you know, if you will. We're among the churches of the New Testament. Not on tablets of stone, but tablets of human heart. So it compares favorably with the law of Moses that was written on tablets of stone in that you know, stone is not living but we are and we have the law of God written on our hearts and it shows in the way that we conduct ourselves as the church or it doesn't I guess but we're aiming for this verse to be true for us that you make it clear in your life that it is ordered according to the letters of the apostles. That it's a matter of your heart, that your heart is right with God. So, you know, again, they, uh, the letter really is about the fact that he's planning to come back and be among them. And, they have to think about this. <laughs> he didn't come the first time because they weren't in order yet. They did get some things in order, and now he plans to come a second time. But he's writing, saying, there's more to do before I get there, or I get there, and it will be sharp and unpleasant. Whatever is called for, Paul is equal to the task, I understand. But you and I are called to the same kind of holiness, and we are called to the, by the same letters to let it be seen and known that we are living the life that is prescribed for us in the Bible. If today you are not a Christian, have you read this book? Do you believe it? Do you understand what it says? And know that you're being called to the light, being called to the life of God. You can be forgiven. And things that are forgiven by God are gone. They are in the past. If you believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, then put him on in baptism for forgiveness of your sins, that you might be raised from the water of baptism, a new person, a new creature created in Christ Jesus. We have water ready for the purpose. 
if you are a Christian and have not lived according to the principles we read here, the, the, the letters of Christ do not show through your heart and through your life. You've got to make that different. You've got to change and repent. And if we can pray for you and your restoration, we'll gladly do that too. We have some other things to talk about in 2 Corinthians. The Lord willing at another opportunity. But today, think about being like what you read in this book. If you need to obey the gospel, if you need to uh, ask for the prayers of the saints, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.